Hey guys and girls, are you out there? How's it going? I hope that you are all well. Welcome to Interesting Stuff, another short but hopefully sweet homeschool educational supplement. Today we will be looking at horseless transport. So transport has been a human necessity for centuries. Forever, basically, since the beginning of time, we have tried to find ways of getting from A to B as quickly as possible, whether by horse or by other means. We are very ingenious, uh, we are as a species. So we've tried using animals, as I mentioned, the horse, we tried the camel, we tried the donkey, basically anything that you could climb on, we have tried to use as transportation. And then with the rise of the industrial age, we started to build our own mechanisms and vehicles. Now, perhaps the first important one was the bicycle. It arrived in 1839 and was invented by a Scottish blacksmith called Kirkpatrick Macmillan. He built his own personal transporter, which was a two-wheeled machine with pedals joined to rods, which turned the back wheel and propelled the cycle forward. I bet he looked crazy to all the people around about him. But then, here's to the crazy ones, right? In 1870, the penny farthing appeared. That's that bike with the big front wheel and the small back wheel. In fact, I saw someone riding one around here last summer. Bizarre. In 1870, the penny farthing appeared. Cyclists had to use steps to reach the high saddle and dismounted by jumping off backwards while the cycle was still in motion. I guess risk was just a part of the fun of the early machines that we used. Wow. Now, motoring transportation for the masses began in the early 1900s. Henry Ford was the first to mass produce cheap and economical vehicles. This was the Model T Ford, affectionately known as Tin Lizzie. And from 1913, it was available, but only in black. And around the same time, a man called Charles Rolls teamed up with another man called Henry Royce, perhaps you recognize those names, to form a luxury car manufacturing firm called Rolls-Royce. Hey, they're still around today, right? Wow. Now their noisy machine was well known for scaring dogs and startling horses. But it was these gentlemen and their courage and perseverance that was typical of early pioneers who were interested in improving how we traveled. They were motorists who braved the elements of the times and adventurers as well, I hasten to add. They were in love with the concept of something called a motor car. There was, of course, the ever-present danger of skidding on wet, greasy or snowy roads. There was the risk of the starting handle slipping and hitting the driver in the face, which actually happened quite often. And there was the hazard of being chased by animals as you went down the road. Did they even have roads back then? Um, I think roads were pretty much a later in invention. Wasn't that surface on roads, that, that tarmac? Wasn't that McAdam? Wasn't he Scottish as well? I think I remember reading something about that somewhere. Yep, the weather's so bad up here that... Um, we spend our times inside thinking about what we can do outside, what we can do to make things better. It wasn't a Macintosh, that raincoat. That was also a Scottish invention. Anyway, garages at that point in time, at the beginning of the 20th century, were few and far between. So motorists carried their own tools, uh, little kits with uh, inner tubes and spark plugs and spare parts and petrol. <laughs> Basically, they carried everything with them. In very cold weather, <clears throat> like, like like now, it's actually snowing outside right now, in very cold weather, the carburetor, which produces an explosive vapor of fuel and air in petrol engines, very often refused to work. And the early mechanics solved this problem by warming parts of the car with a hot iron. Oh, oh those were the days, right? Uh, on many hot days, there was a risk of the engine overheating. Uh, that's a classic. Still happens today. 
And in towns, cars' wheels got caught up in tram lines. To protect motorists' interests, automobile clubs and associations were formed throughout Europe, and the first of these was the Automobile Club of France, founded in Paris at the end of the 19th century. In the early days of the horseless carriage, as the car was first known, because they didn't have horses pulling them, right? Uh, in Britain, a man carrying a red flag was legally obliged to walk in front of each machine to warn pedestrians of its approach. How impractical, impractical? How not practical is that, basically? Um, but I guess it was a job for somebody, right? This absurdity was eventually abolished, thankfully. Now, motoring was gradually, slowly taken up by professional men, such as doctors, who abandoned horse carriages for their rounds, and took to cars, such as the German Opel Doktorwagen, a two-seater with an adjustable hood. The rich, of course, spared no expense and had very large cars, often with an enclosed passenger compartment. One of these was the limousine, which was named after the cloth used in the material inside, which is produced in a province of France. The limousine was associated with luxury. For instance, one aristocrat had armchairs placed inside his limousine, which then turned into a bed as well. Not to mention a wine cabinet. But remember, don't drink and drive. It's not a good idea. Mm, we have rules for reasons, right? <laughs> so whatever you think about cars and other forms of transportation, they are now an essential part of our daily life. It's really crazy to think back and realize that once upon a time, these roads weren't here, these cars weren't here. Maybe even the houses and buildings around where you live weren't there. It's incredible how civilization gets built up over time. So... Cars, as we know, as with all forms of transportation, have advanced with the technologies to become much more refined and much, much safer. Computers have made the identification of faults easier and the negative environmental impacts are now lower than they have ever been. Remember how you used to get high on the fumes? Mm, crazy, huh? I'm not, not you, right? But, um, you know, people <laughs> people working in garages, right? It was crazy and pretty unhealthy as well, I imagine. Regarding the future, who knows what's going to happen? Will there be more cars? Will there be less cars? Will cars get banned from city centers? Who knows? Will cars fly? Maybe. I'm not sure that's a good idea, though, as we have enough problems driving them on the roads. I'm not sure we want them in the sky as well. Will they go faster? Um, I don't think I need my car to go any faster than it goes. I'm quite happy with that. And uh, with all the snow outside, I, it's interesting. I watched a couple of vans having problems getting, getting up the local hill today as I was walking through town. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, some, <laughs> some things never grow old, do they? So what's your favorite car? Do you have one? Drop me a message. Let me know what you think. Um, I hope this has been entertaining for you, at least a little bit. What was your first what was your first car? Do you remember do you remember what kind of car your parents had? Do you remember the first your first experiences? We take it we take it for granted that um that it's just part of our lives now. But um as always, we should count our blessings and I don't think we should take anything for granted at all. Thanks for listening, and as usual, I will drop some questions under the video and you can check how much you remember from this uh little speech. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I wish you an absolutely fantastic day. And I'll drop you some more knowledge real soon. Take care.